Hello, I am Rieli and today I would like to share this watercolor painting process with you while talking some decision-making nonsense. Today I will be painting a glacier. To get this reference, I am again making use of my extended network. They work in all sorts of exotic places and this particular picture was taken by Lisa Yershova somewhere in the Arctic. I don't want to copy the reference exactly, but I'll still follow it rather closely. My aim is to learn how glaciers work, so I can later paint one from imagination. The composition will be somewhat similar to the photo, but I am adding some space to the right of the glacier. While I do like the looming glacier filling almost the whole field of view, I feel that this perception would be enhanced by adding a sliver of an iceberg on the very right, forming a narrow path between the two. But I didn't want to deal with that. The horizon is interesting here. It's unclear where it ends and where the sky begins, so I try to incorporate it into the piece. I sketch out pretty much every detail because I anticipate panic and confusion when the time comes to paint wet on wet. So I need a cleaner sketch and I don't mind pencil lines showing through. They add liveliness to the work and most of the time I regret keeping the lines too light. It reminds me of when I was taking drawing classes and I would work on a drawing for hours, but from a distance the paper would still look white because my hatching was so light. If, however, graphite lines bother you, you can use colored pencils or watercolor pencils for sketching. I personally don't like watercolor pencils for sketching because they dissolve and affect the color, but this may be exactly the effect you're looking for, so give it a try. People also use red and blue pencils to establish where the light and the shadow areas are. If you use high-quality paper, you can also erase the pencil lines, even when they are painted over. It may be more difficult due to gum arabic in the paint, which is essentially a glue, but it still can be done. Five years ago, I was painting a heat plant with five identical towers. One tower ended up leaning significantly, and I didn't notice it until I had already laid down the first layer of paint. I let the paper dry, took an eraser, and corrected it, and I can't notice even a hint of the original sketch in the sky. I am using Artist Cold Press 640 GSM paper, partly because I ran out of thinner cold press paper, and partly because I lack confidence. I haven't done watercolor in a single layer for almost a year, and I'm not ready to work wet on wet on such a format on thinner paper. Working on thick paper has its benefits and challenges. It stays wet longer, making wet on wet work easier, but if you are not used to it, it may be tricky, as paint continues to move longer than you may expect. This time I decided not to use a particularly limited palette and selected everything that may make sense in the context of the scene. This first color is my new favorite yellow PY227 from Memory Blue. It's a modern inorganic pigment, highly light fast, and it is luminous in thin layers and not chalky in mass tone. Then I add Pyrrole Orange PO73 in case I want some glow or to neutralize the teals. PR209 is the cool red for today, and PB28 Cobalt Turquoise is the blue. I throw in some more blues, Cerulean Blue PB35, Thalo Blue PB15 as a deeper cyan, Cobalt Blue PB74 for some texture, and Indian Throne Blue PB60 mainly for the water. I also add a PBR25, a red-brown color that is essentially a muted orange, to neutralize the blues. I have three more colors there, Loki knows for what purpose, I didn't even use them in the end. I wet the paper under the tap from both sides and waited for it to absorb water. And now comes one of many watercolorists' nightmares. I ruined the paper. I started suspecting it once I saw how unevenly the paper was absorbing the moisture and the degree of damage became evident when I applied the first layer of paint. Usually when I work wet on wet, I put an actual cloth underneath the painting. Now I did not have any and used these tissue papers, and as they did not lie flat on the table, I pushed the soaked paper against them with my fingers and ruined the paper fibers when I touched it. Artist paper is very durable and you can use all sorts of erasers on it, but even arches, when soaked wet, becomes much more fragile. So you can see the fingerprints everywhere I touched the paper. 
Usually I'm very careful trying not to touch paper while dry because the oils from the skin may affect the lay down of paint. But I didn't realize how sensitive the wet paper becomes to this kind of damage while you can scrape the paint with a synthetic brush without damaging the fibers. As this was a practice piece, I still decided to proceed and see whether I could salvage it and potentially learn something from it. I begin painting by covering the whole scene with the color of the light. Here it is pink and yellow in the sky and the cyan glow of the glaciers. Painting of the glacier itself can be distilled to three simple rules. The parts of the glacier that transmit light are blue-green, while the parts that are thicker, are not that transmissive or are at a different angle, get a more violet shade. The same rule applies for seascapes when the shallow sea looks cyan and the deeper it gets, the bluer it becomes. Here we only get the inky deep sea with a small reflection of the glacier. Finally, the upward facing surfaces become whiter, both because they're powdered with snow and because the whole scene is lit from above. These shifts of hue are very important to keep in mind for painting any subject. I often see watercolor tutorials suggesting painting the sky as a simple dark to light gradient, but if you observe the sky closely, it is always lighter and yellower towards the horizon and more purple leaning right above your head. And this applies to almost any weather at any altitude and latitude, but the exact details would vary. In a sunset, you may have yellow transitioning into a muted deep blue, while on a sunny day, the sky may go from a lighter teal shade to almost an ultramarine hue. A couple more words about the choice of the subject. For a long time, I was painting landscapes as a stepping stone for more complex illustrations because they allowed me to practice color mixing and building a cohesive environment, taking matching the shapes out of the equation. After all, rocks and trees, while having some internal logic to their structure, are way more error tolerant than faces. This glacier was no exception. I wanted to practice working with some cool blues and teals that I barely ever use and I was contemplating turning it into some sci-fi or fantasy scene with the glacier glowing from within, but decided to stick to realism for now. Toward the end, I go from applying a paint of tea-like consistency to what would be paint straight from the tube if I indeed were using tube paints. This is especially important when working on a thicker paper that remains wet for a long time and soaks up the paint. If there is not enough pigment on the paper, when it dries, you may realize that the color looks odd, patchy and whitish. For that reason, I emphasize the darkest darks with thick paint of gouache-like consistency and for the lighter objects, the pigments with a narrower tonal range come in handy. They allow thick application of a relatively light tone without adding white into the mix. Here I used cobalt turquoise to add reflection of the glacier in water. When it came to naming the piece, I instantly thought of sunk cost fallacy, both because of its maritime associations and because painting for two hours on the ruined sheet of paper is a literal embodiment of it. But I would argue that going through with it was not fallacious after all. A sunk cost fallacy is a phenomenon of choosing not to abandon a strategy because of the high investment of effort, time and money in the past, even when the abandonment would be more productive and would cut the future costs. It occurs both in business decision making and in more everyday contexts. A textbook example of such fallacy is the Concorde supersonic airliner that took way more time and money to develop and in the end did not deliver the expected result. Or it can be as mundane as small as you may choose to continue reading a boring book just because you already read a part of it rather than doing something else. But in economics, there are clear criteria of whether a strategy is successful, that is, the monetary profit it brings in the end. If there is no way in Hades the net income will cover the investment, it's time to cut the losses. But even if we go back to the boring book example, things are not so straightforward. Maybe you have good reasons to believe that the book is going to take up speed. Maybe it's a classic and you are reading it to educate yourself. Maybe you are a storyteller and you want to dissect precisely why this book is boring, not to make the same mistake yourself. 
Also, we should consider the scale. Several hours you spend reading a book are nothing compared to a decade and billions of pounds spent on Concord. Fallacies of this kind are usually not just nasty bugs implanted into our brain to prevent us from rational decision-making, but have evolutionary origins that were selected for. As much as we can debate Engels' view on the role of labor in human evolution and show capuchin monkeys who use stone tools, the Homo genus is still the only one associated with consistent use of varied tools. Imagine you're an ancient human following the migration path of some bison or deer into an unknown territory. You are carrying a heavy stone nucleus with you. The nucleus is heavy, and you may be tempted to drop it and to look for raw materials along the way. And you, indeed, would be looking for stone along the way, and eventually you will find something, but before you find a good source, you may simply die of starvation. In such circumstances, thinking about the sunk cost in cutting the losses terms and dropping the nucleus would be stupid. So one may argue that such ability to commit to a strategy, even without a clear profit in sight, could be selected for and could be a factor that ultimately allowed us to progress as a species and build a civilization. So I prefer to delude myself that painting this was not a fallacy. This piece was primarily for practice and I could learn the structure of glaciers regardless of the fingerprints all around. I was also curious whether I could mask most of the fingerprints in the process. After all, every time you touch the paper with a brush, the paper gets at least some of the same force as it got from touching it. So I thought that especially in the darker areas, these spots would even out and this indeed happened in the sea. And while I know that this paper was ruined, the viewer wouldn't know that and might actually appreciate this artwork or find this effect interesting. And finally, I did not just make a painting, but also a piece of a hopefully educational content. And all of that for just two hours of my time. Please like this video if you appreciated it. Comment, subscribe and share it with your friends. And don't sink.